This video was sponsored by Campfire. More on that later. Howdy, y'all. Welcome to the video. There comes a moment in every character's development when the writer must ask themselves, what does this character sound like? Maybe I think this guy's gotta sound tough and coarse like he really means business. Or perhaps they must sound ancient and ethereal, by which I of course mean kinda British. Or maybe you'll just do your best Scottish even though your only exposure to the accent has been Gimli and Scrooge McDuck. Or maybe you'll just go for the Nick Cage impression and call it a day. A character's character really comes through in their voice. In written media, that's a narrative voice, the tone they're written in. But in media with an audio component, it's a literal voice. While you might think that audio media would have a serious advantage in this category, prose can be really good at communicating a distinct narrative voice. The written word is a very impressive thing. But there's some trickiness there right off the bat. See, language is very weird conceptually, and it changes very quickly. Try getting a laugh with what are those these days. So unless the story you're writing is taking place in the time and place that matches up with the version of the language you're writing in, there's liable to be some dissonance between the story and the language it's written in. Lots of 60s sci-fi is set in the future, sometimes even the past by now, but it still has some hallmarks of the 60s baked into the language, and it still feels very much of its time. Obviously, the ideal course of action to avoid this kind of dating would be to write in a totally formal and neutral form of the language which, while theoretically free of watermarks of the era, also doesn't work because even the formal textbook stuff changes over time. How many of you are properly using the and thou these days? There is no such thing as dialect-free language. Since slang has a tendency to creep in from social context, language is buried in the social context it's used in, and when a dialect forms, that social context is really baked in. Every form of language has associations, and this is most obvious with accents. Every dialect has at least one accent, and all language is subdivided into dialects. There is no such thing as unaccented speech, just like there is no dialect-free speech. And because accents are rooted in dialects, and dialects are rooted in specific social contexts, accents carry some of that context with them. Now the thing is, most people don't really think they speak with an accent. Everyone sounds normal to their own ears. There's this false dichotomy between has an accent and doesn't have an accent, and writers fall into this very noticeably if they decide to write a character with a specific accent. For instance, Bram Stoker loved giving his side characters nearly incomprehensible transcribed accents, while his main characters, with the exception of the definitely American Quincy Morris, have no phonetic accent and are generally using dictionary accurate English. But from the narrative voice, it's still pretty clear what accent it's supposed to be spoken in. Some sentences like, here I am who shall be 20 in September and yet I never had a proposal till today, not a real proposal, and today I have had three, just fancy, just don't sound right in my neutral accent or any accent but posh British. And then there's Quincy, whose lines don't sound right in any accent. Miss Lucy, I know I ain't good enough to regulate the fixings of your little shoes, but I guess if you wait till you find a man that is, you will go join them seven young women with the lamps when you quit. Won't you just hitch up alongside of me and let us go down the long road together, driving in double harness? Ugh. So writers usually write in their own neutral language, which is, of course, a uniquely personal dialect and accent that still registers as normal to them due to familiarity. And when they want to single out a character as outside that normal, well, sometimes they give them an accent they find outside the normal, hoping to carry the associations they have with that accent. Since language is steeped in implications, this is one of the most efficient ways to get across some structural character traits. In theory. In practice, because language is so steeped in implications, this can be a bit like trying to paint on a little bit of smoky eye and accidentally dropping the entire housewares section on someone. Of course, sometimes characters just get given accents because they're fun. It's not always that deep. And in cases when that's true, it's just as casual as any other character trait. We made this character have this accent because they're from this place or because it's fun, and that's as far as that goes. But while sometimes an accent is just an accent, sometimes it's meant to signal more than that. And that's where things start getting complicated. But before we dive into accents and how they're used in fiction, specifically accents of English, we have to address why this story is written in English at all. Many stories take place in settings that aren't specifically the English-speaking regions of modern-day Earth. In fact, they may have very little to do with Earth at all. And English is a serious hot mess of a language, with its linguistic development rooted in a lot of goofy and highly specific historical shenanigans. How do we justify its presence in a story or world that doesn't line up with the version of the language we're using? Now, the realistic or doyalist explanation is that the story is written in modern English because it's being written by a writer who's fluent in it and intended for an audience who's also fluent in it. And as narratively accurate as it might be to write the whole thing in your own personal conlang, the goal of a story is to be read, so you probably want to make it readable. Finnegan's Wake is purposefully written in not contemporary English, and it's notorious for being nigh incomprehensible. But like all doyalist explanations, this requires a little suspension of disbelief, and since we're asking the question, we're clearly not suspending our disbelief. Specifically, we're harpooning our disbelief out of the sky for the purposes of narrative analysis. So let's look at the in-universe or Watsonian explanation. Now, this explanation can vary a lot. Sometimes it's just not addressed, which is fine most of the time. Like I said, suspension of disbelief. Totally fair to hand wave the language you're writing in, because what else can you be reasonably expected to do? Then some stories write in stuff like universal translators, especially 
especially popular in sci-fi narratives, though there's still no explanation as to why the version of English the translators default to is the same one that was popular when the story was made. And then, as always, there's Tolkien setting the high bar of insanity with the ultimate explanation for why his fantasy epics are written in English, specifically that he translated them into English. In the meta-narrative around The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, Tolkien claims that he's drawing on a primary source called the Red Book of Westmarch, specifically several annotated and edited copies of the original manuscript, which was written by Bilbo but lost to history. He's basically deriving this from the Norse Eddas, where the originals are also not available. This original story would have been written in one of the many conlangs Tolkien created for this world, and The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings were just translations and compilations from this original source text. The names aren't even the same. Like Mary, full name Meriadoc, who was supposedly originally named Chilimanzar, which was shortened to Chilik, which meant happy or merry. So in the process of translating, quote unquote, Tolkien renamed him Meriadoc, which could be shortened directly to Mary. This is the high bar explanation for why the story is in English when the original has no reason to be, and it's also a convenient segue into an extremely relevant topic, localization. Localization is a term that'll be painfully familiar to anime fans. It describes the process by which a story is translated, rewritten, and adapted to appeal to a specific regional audience. It essentially attempts to recontextualize the story so that this new audience can appreciate it in the same way its original audience would have appreciated it. Mapping unfamiliar context from the original into a more familiar parallel, attempting to reproduce the original vibe which was lost when the story was removed from its source context. Kind of like those early 2000s reimaginings of Shakespeare plays into modern settings. Tolkien renames his characters Merry and Pippin because to his audience of mid-1900s England, those names would have sounded cheerful and homey to match the characters, where the original names of Chillick and Razal would sound weird and alien. Of course, since he was making up the original story and localizing kind of backwards, this is a dubious example. Unlike the case of Lysistrata, a comedic play written by Aristophanes in the 400s BC, wherein the women of Athens and Sparta worked together to end the Peloponnesian War by refusing to bone the men until they cut it out. I read a translation of it in high school and noticed something very weird about the Spartan character Lampido, she was written with a very noticeable Scottish accent. Recognizing that this play had been written in ancient Greek, I asked my teacher where the heck that accent had come from, and she told me that the author of our translation was British. The logic had basically been that to the Athenian audience, the Spartans were crude, violent brawlers, so Sparta was to Athens as Scotland was to England. Basically, it's a big old stereotype full of ethnic humor, isn't that fun? It's not just England, by the way, since the English perception of Scotland isn't the same as, say, the American perception of Scotland, or the Scottish perception of Scotland, other translations localize with different accents to carry the same implications. For instance, American translations of Lysistrata often suggest an Appalachian accent for Lempido. So the translator for Lysistrata localized the play to an English audience by telling them these Spartans were basically Scots. And they weren't the only ones. Thanks to Gerard Butler's dulcet tones, the Spartans in 300 also sound Scottish. Except for the Queen. She gets to sound English. In fact, English seems to be the official accent of all of human history since everyone from Roman emperors to French revolutionaries will be inexplicably extremely British. Les Mis has this bad. We show that the students at the barricades are classy because of their mild BBC English accents, and then we show that Gavroche is a low-class gutter snipe by giving him a Cockney accent. In France, lest we forget. The use of accents in fiction is often a tool to localize a narrative by leveraging local stereotypes to map to less familiar stereotypes. We might not be able to recognize a low-class French accent, so when we translate it into English, we use Cockney as the code instead. Though of course, we Americans only recognize Cockney as the stereotypical low-class accent because it gets used that way so much. It's pretty circular. And accents don't always have to be linked with ethnic stereotypes. Consider talking like a pirate when you gotta get across that you're pirates, for instance. That accent has the distinction of being almost completely made up, too, which I guess just proves that you don't need to leverage existing stereotypes when building your fictional demographics. Anyway, classical literature aside, localization was also a serious concern in the earlier days of anime dubbing. This might sound weird in the post simul dub world we live in, where anime has infiltrated every level of our society, but back in the day, the idea that Americans might enjoy Japanese television was extremely… controversial? At minimum, it was kind of untested, so when dubbing companies started trying to dub anime for a mainstream American audience, sometimes they made some pretty significant changes to make it more palatable. The dubbing company 4Kids was kind of notorious for this. When they dubbed Pokemon, for instance, they would systematically scrape out any and all references to Japanese culture, including the food. Rice balls would be crudely photoshopped out and replaced with things like crackers or sub sandwiches. They'd also rename characters, which was more notable in how they dubbed Yu-Gi-Oh! Japanese names like Jonochi Katsuya, Anzu, and Honda became Joey Wheeler, Taya and Tristan. And this is also where they really went ham on the accents. Those of you who watch the dub or are otherwise familiar with Yu-Gi-Oh! The Abridged series will know that Joey has an extremely noticeable Brooklyn accent, and Bakura has a British accent. Neither of these make all that much sense in context, everyone seems to have kind of grown up in roughly the same neighborhood, but the accents are there anyway. This is because, in the original Japanese, both characters had fairly distinct styles of speech, styles that don't translate into English very easily. Japanese has some very specific modes of formality in speech, ranging from a very informal mode, used
used when talking to close friends or family up to a very formal mode that can sound almost archaic in daily use. Joey, or Jonochi, notably uses the absolute least formal speech no matter who he's talking to, because he's a pretty brash, rude guy without an ounce of respect for authority. It doesn't really matter to him if he's talking to his best friend or a bazillionaire CEO, he'll be casual just the same. And in contrast, Bakura speaks extremely formally. Most of his lines could come out of a textbook, no slang, informality, or abbreviation anywhere. This doesn't apply to his evil alter ego, by the way, kid's just polite. So when localizing, the translators gave Joey a thick Brooklyn accent and Bakura a British accent to clue the audience in that Joey was loud and rude and that Bakura was formal and polite. And while it wasn't strictly an accent, when translating for Yugi and Yami, they had to deal with the fact that Yugi describes himself with the personal pronoun Boku, which just means I, but has implications of youth or immaturity, while Yami uses Ore, which also just means I, but has implications of masculinity, maturity, and superiority. So while the original Japanese version just had Yami kind of sounding a little more confident than Yugi, the dub also made Yami sound considerably older with a much deeper voice. What's interesting is that their localization efforts actually kind of flattened one of the characters. The villain, Pegasus, was an American in the original Japanese version, and he talked really, really weirdly. He would use English words in place of Japanese words almost at random, and he handled honorifics really bizarrely. Japanese appends honorifics to names. You don't just call someone by their name, you append something like kun or san or sama or chan. They mean stuff like mister or miss or lord or imply diminutives like kid. Pegasus would append boy, like the English word boy in place of kun, which kind of means boy, but you would never use them interchangeably. And he still does this in the English dub, calling people like Kaiba boy and stuff. But while it's still pretty weird, it loses the context of how staggeringly bizarre he sounded in the original Japanese. He was like the inverse of that person who sprinkles random Japanese into their English because they've gotten way into anime and they think that's sufficient to learn a language. To properly localize it, he probably should have been saying stuff like, Konnichiwa, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to my Simply Sugoi tournament. So specifically giving a character an accent is usually meant to code to the the audience that this character is intended to carry associations of that accent, whereas not giving a character an explicit accent leaves it implied to be neutral, though as we've discussed, there still is an accent present, just one considered neutral by the author. Bram Stoker's non-Quincy, non-Van Helsing main characters still sound strange when read in a non-English accent because the accent is connected with the dialect and the dialect the book uses is fairly standard highbrow English, but because those characters speak in a similar dialect to the one used in the narration, it comes across as a neutral accent. We're not supposed to infer anything about those characters from their speech patterns unlike the goofy foreign Dr. Van Helsing or the bold American cowboy Quincy Morris. Now, like all coding, this is very tricky to do, and it's easy to accidentally communicate associations you don't mean. And it can also be hard to distinguish traits of the character from traits of the stereotype you're coding them with. Tolkien's elves may have talked kinda posh British in the movie, but derivative elves in other works often also act posh British, where the originals were just very ancient and alien. And how many traits of modern fantasy dwarves borrow from Tolkien's complex originals instead of just dipping into the well of Scottish stereotypes that got attached by the movie? When you're coding a character, you have less control than you might want over how the audience reads the character. The other difficulty, of course, is that because language changes surprisingly quickly, the coding can also change out from under you. Stoker's use of transcribed phonetic accents probably carried a lot of associations at the time, but nowadays they're nearly incomprehensible. It's hard enough to understand what the characters are even saying, let alone what stereotypes were supposed to be assigning them. The problem with localizing or coding for an audience is it only works on that specific audience, and as time and society marches on, the coding loses some of the context that made it work in the first place. <sighs> let's see. Um, sometimes an accent is just an accent, but sometimes it's a lot more than that, and sometimes that can be a problem. Language is weird, writing is hard, accents are deceptively hard, and if you think you're good at one, you're probably wrong. So, yeah. And thanks again to Campfire for sponsoring this video. Campfire Pro is a writing software designed to help writers stay organized while they work. It's got character pages to help keep everyone's bios straight, plot and story timelines to nail down the actual story beats, corkboard style maps to keep the location straight, and character arcs so you can keep an eye on everyone's narrative trajectory. While that's already really useful, you might want to spring for the world building pack, an expansion on the base Campfire Pro that adds support for species, magic systems, items, and plenty of tools for building out cultures with components like religions, philosophies, and languages, for if you want to go full Tolkien with the conlangs and really lean into your dialects and accents. Conveniently, Campfire Pro has a 10-day free trial to let you get a feel for the software, and if you do decide to spring for it after that, it's a one-time purchase of $49.99. The World Building Pro Pack is an optional add-on for another $24.99, also one time, and once you've got it, you've got it forever. Pretty slick. So if this sounds interesting, check out the link in the description.